Welcome back to the Village Bonfire for another episode of the Wild Sacred Journey podcast. A podcast not just for your mind, but for your body and spirit too. Here we don't just talk theory. Instead, we compassionately engage with our lived experiences and a wide variety of topics together, all to invite the question, in these times we find ourselves in, how do we be more human? Thank you for being here. May these conversations awaken, inspire, repair, and evolve something deep within each of us and serve the wild, tender aliveness of our personal and collective hearts. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Wild Sacred Journey podcast. Oops, almost couldn't get that out. The Wild Sacred Journey podcast. (laughs) And so uh, I'm your host, Kate Powell. And this will be another solo episode today. And yeah, oh yeah, I was going to say I'm a, uh, yeah, a medicine woman, a ceremonialist, a story weaver, and a soul revival guide. So, um, which is kind of a new addition, like the wording of that is sort of a new addition. And so we'll kind of get into that probably a little bit in a moment. But as we're sort of diving in today, we're going to, light our candle, our village fire. Take a few deep breaths in and out. And just let yourself come to whatever your center is in this moment as best you can. Perhaps feel the rise and fall of your chest for a moment. Perhaps feel your feet on the ground, the floor, whatever they're touching. Perhaps feel the weight of your sits bones, of your pelvic bowl, on whatever it's touching, if anything. Or if you're walking, then perhaps you feel the weight of it as you shift your weight from one foot to the other. And we acknowledge our bodies, the land, all the things that conspired to bring us here and now in this moment in time and the responsibility that we have for those who come after with a deep gratitude, a thank you, thank you, thank you. So if you've been listening along, you'll have heard that, you know, I just over a month ago, a month and a few days, I um, came back to the States from sort of a four month soul pilgrimage to Scotland and Ireland that had been like, intuitively I'd sort of felt the tugging of that building for a while and it finally happened and um it was amazing and now I'm like deep in the integration space of that which has been quite a mental emotional and physical roller coaster (laughs) soulful roller coaster um but one of the things that I've been sitting with I was reading some John O'Donohue who's an Irish um I guess we call him like poet philosopher, theologian, um, just really wise, wise human, um, or was late. Uh, yeah, he passed away in, I think 2008. Um, but anyway, I was reading one of his books and he was speaking about absence and it really, um, yeah, it really got me thinking about absence and presence and sort of these two forces. And, you know, a lot of my work, I talk about wholeness, um, you know, which I think in our sort of more presence focused world or, or sort of more tangible focused world, (laughs) material focused world can mean like our single selves and all the little fragmentations, all the things like pulling us in a million different directions, all the parts of us that we didn't feel safe being, or we didn't feel confident being, where we received or internalized messaging that it wasn't good to be, that it was a risk to our belonging, to our family, 
or to our peers or to larger society to be those things. And so we disown them. We sent them to live outside of us, right? Or it could be like all the demands on our attention, all the ways we feel pulled in a million directions. So there's a lot of ways where fragmentation kind of happens, all the ways we judge ourselves, we um, are at war with ourselves, right? Trying to be something we, we think we should be rather than sort of what we are or, you know, whatever that is, there's a lot of different ways that we end up fragmented. And so I think a lot of this work of wholeness, which is also the work of integration in a lot of ways, is to take these pieces and bring them back together again. And so when we can do that, we shift our presence, right? We shift our ability to be present. And, you know, when we hear a lot in meditation spaces and spiritual spaces and yoga, you know, whatever, all the different sort of soul seeking spaces, right? Um, we hear about presence, you know, and, um, and it's so important, you know, one of my first teachers in my yoga teacher training, um, I do teachers for that. And one of them would say all the time, like who you are, when you teach is what you're teaching, you know, and that's always stood me in, in really good stead. And then, and when I entered into my more energetic, more shamanic, uh, training, you know, my teachers there used to always say presence is primary, you know, and we spent the entire first year of our training, just working on presencing ourselves and where we presenced ourselves from before we even started learning to work with other people and protocols for working with other people. Because the presence piece is so important, you know, you can feel it when somebody's like with you, but not really with you, you know, or you can feel it when, um, you know, somebody's feeling really pulled in a lot of different directions, or it can feel unsettling or unsafe to be around somebody like on a nervous system level, I'm saying to be around somebody who's like sort of presenting one way, but like, you can tell that it's not fully authentic to what's going on sort of behind, right? There's like a mask and you're sort of aware of the mask. And then you're sort of aware of what's behind the mask and there's a dissonance there. And, and that dissonance usually causes our nervous systems to respond in some way, usually unsettled, usually slightly dysregulating often can be interpreted as unsafe, right? Cause you kind of can't tell like what's actually going on. You know, you don't know where you stand. So coming into presence and, you know, presence in a lot of ways is also a space where we can actually listen from. Right. And so like being able to receive our discernment, our animal instinct, and then also our intuition, right. Our, our like sort of beyond sensory perception, right. Like those things have to happen from presence. Otherwise we risk misinterpreting or just not even hearing because the, our, whatever's happening, whatever else is happening, then fragmentation becomes so loud, um, that we kind of can't hear. Right. So presence super important, but I used to lead people, um, you know, so, so I started when he was talking about absence, I was like, Oh yeah, what is that? And I was like, that's such a piece of wholeness too, actually. And he says at one point, you know, um, you know, absence and is the sister of presence and the opposite of presence is actually vacancy, not absence. And so we'll kind of come back to that, I think in a little bit, but, um, yeah, but I was really sitting with, okay, what does absence feel like? And I started realizing like, oh yeah, I used to, when I would, um, facilitate yoga asana practices, I would often at the end, like in Shavasana, I would start to kind of cue people to, okay, bring your awareness to your breath. And so let's go ahead and do this right now. So just start to notice your breath as you breathe in and out and you don't have to fix it or do anything. There's no special breath you need here. You just have to watch the breath that's happening in your body. And so maybe that's just feeling it flow in and out through your nose or your mouth. Maybe that's feeling it in your chest or your belly. And so as you start to tune into that, the breath is the thing, right? So we're paying attention to the thing, the breath, the presence.
And now start to notice the tiny space between your inhale and your exhale. And it may be very small, or maybe it's larger, just depending on what your breath is, what your breathing rhythm is in this moment. But there's a tiny gap where there's no inhale and no exhale happening. And so that's the nothing, the absence, right? And that same gap is actually also around your breath, right? Atoms are actually mostly space. <laughs> so these things that we think of as so solid in our lives, like, you know, the table here, or even my own body, right, are actually mostly space. They're mostly absence. And so there's so much more absence within and around the thing, the solid thing, the presence, than there is actually presence. And so, you know, that, that absence is actually a space where spirit is, is what spirit is, is, is what the mysterious is, is what the unknowable and unnameable is. And so it's so interesting too, as I started thinking about this more was like, so our soul actually, cause I've been thinking a lot about home recently, you know, cause I come back from this trip and everyone's like, oh, welcome home. And I'm like, not sure this is home or if it is home, it's a home, but I, you know, it, I have many homes at this point and they satisfy different needs. Right. And we need a home for our human self, Right a shelter, a place where we feel loved and cared for, you know, or we feel safe or we feel like we can relax deeply. Right. And then we also need these soul homes, these places we go to that are more mysterious, that are a little bit more wild, untamed, unknown, right? Like more on that, that threshold, that edge so that our soul, actually our soul is often nourished by different things than what our human self is nourished by. Right. And we like need spaces where both those two main aspects of who we are can receive the different types of nourishment and sense of belonging and sense of rest and relaxation and yeah, and, and growth that they need. Right. So if our soul belongs to sort of spirit, right, then our soul is actually at home in the absence and so when we incarnate into human form, if, if you believe in this, right. But when our, however, when we are born forth into this material world, right. From nothing to something. And when we're born forth into this material world, then our soul actually experiences this material world as the loss, right? Because when our soul is in absence in that space within and around, our soul feels belonging. And when we come into our human self, our human self would experience, you know, our, our human self would actually experience absence as loss, right? So it's like our human self is experiencing presence as belonging and absence as John O'Donohue talks about belonging and longing, right? So you know, or in this case, loss, maybe, right? The, the feeling of I can rest here, or I need, I hunger for something, right? And so, because we're wired to feel belonging, we're wired to have that feel like a necessary safety um, need, right? So if our human self is our presence in this world, then our presence needs belonging with people, with things, with places, right? And would experience absence, it actually almost fears absence because absence might also be exile. It might be um, loneliness rather than solitude. It might be, um, yeah, it feels like a loss, a longing, a, a sort of almost a danger actually. And yet our souls 
they experience belonging when they're in absence, when they're in no thingness, right? And so to come into this human form is actually the severance and the longing because now we're in this form and we can lose things and we can die and things, resources are finite, right? We came from infinite energy and now there's, you know, material limitations to things, right? And so that feels to our soul, that feels like a little uncomfortable and strange, right? And so we're sort of like our experience is actually like kind of caught between like the balance and tension of these two things, right? Like that our soul will always feel sort of quote unquote exiled in our human form and our human form will always feel a little bit afraid of exile in our soul form, right? And exile has a very strong connotation. So, you know, I, I don't use that lightly, but I think that's the fear language of it, right? Whereas like, when we can really start to make peace with and embody and make friends with the space of the balance and the tension between them, then it's like realizing that we're always in a dance between belonging and longing. And that when our human self feels the most belonging, our soul self might feel the most longing. And when our soul self feels the most longing or belonging, our human self might feel the most longing, you know, and maybe there's places or moments where both of those things feel them together. And that's amazing, <laughs> but we're meant to kind of like, you know, I think it, it feels like that's, it's actually necessary to experience the contradiction and the paradox and be in the and space between those in order to have creativity, in order to have the impulse to keep making things, to keep growing, to keep moving, to keep um, exploring and discovering and being in wonder and being in curiosity, right? And they both have an energy to them, right? And so that's, I think, the distinction there where vacancy is actually more the opposite because vacancy is a lack of energy. Whereas, you know, if you feel into the two words, right? Like absence you're probably going to have a strong response to that word, possibly, maybe not, but maybe, but the word absence, when you, when I say that, like, I at least feel an energy in the absence, right? The absence has some level of like, we want to call it consciousness or yeah, some level of somethingness even if we can't name it and it's mysterious and we can't see it or touch it or smell it, you know, whereas vacancy, yeah, it just feels empty, um, dead, you know, in a way that absence doesn't actually feel dead. So yeah. So I think as we're kind of you know, and, and I've been feeling into this a lot too. I think part of why this felt particularly poignant for me coming back from this trip, you know, is that there's a lot that I'm really missing, right? Like there's a lot about who I was over there, how I was over there, the people I met over there, um, the ways I was navigating my days while I was on this trap, this trip, this pilgrimage, this travel, um, that, I'm really in longing about, right? And yet there's also a certain level of comfort, security, friendship, care, belonging that I have here too. And then, yeah, and so letting myself, I've been sort of exploring, letting myself just be in the space between those two things and, and letting myself kind of make peace with, because I noticed how quickly the second I like started to feel the loss of something or the missing of something, how quickly I wanted to fix it, right? And, and it, so it was interesting to start to be like, what if this is, again, like I kind of talked about in the last episode with sort of heartbreak, right? Like, what if this isn't actually a design flaw? Like, uh, can you tell I'm also in a period of like, 
yeah, I, I've, as, as old patterns have been coming up recently, like I've had this mantra for myself or this like intention or just this repeated, like anchoring phrase for myself. That's like, you don't have to get it right. And you don't have to know how to do this. You just have to be kinder to yourself than you were last time this came up. <laughs> so I've been in this space of like, yeah, I think really dropping into like, what if these aren't all design flaws? <laughs> um, which that's a pretty revolutionary concept right there. Like how much of the systems of power in our world would crumble if we stopped thinking we were flawed by design? <laughs> Which isn't to say we have to be perfect, right? And isn't to say that there won't be mess. But again, what if the mess is part of the point? What if the imperfection is the point, right? And so it's the same then too, kind of with this like, yeah, with this with this absence and this longing, like what if that's actually the point? And so as I'm sitting here in this space, it's like, yeah, I can start like picking through and noticing like, what am I longing for, right? And like, what am I missing? And that's actually pointing me in the direction of something my soul or my human self or both really need or want to, to, yeah, to, ha to feel more of this wholeness, right? Because wholeness, you know, it's like expanding this definition of wholeness for me that I started talking about earlier, the wholeness, instead of being about fragmentation, it is about that drawing those pieces back together, but that's wholeness of presence right? And real wholeness also includes the absence, right? Because if it's soul human, if it's that walking that balance edge between being, you know, of being both of those things and feeling the tension of being both of those things, then wholeness has to be the and space between those things, between the absence and the presence, between the belonging and the longing. And so, yeah, so I've been like, okay, instead of trying to fix it right away, what if I just let that longing be there and let it actually point me in the direction of my creative energy because belonging is very nourishing, but it's not necessarily the most generative energy. It's usually a little bit more like when I feel belonging, true belonging, like I can be or do or say anything. There's almost like my whole system relaxes and there's more of this like receptive open rest energy. And that doesn't mean I can't create from that place, but it's not a particularly instigating spark of energy. It's more of a relaxation spark of energy, at least for me. So it got me thinking about like, oh, this is also part of why integration is so important actually, because then having the absence from the thing, the absence from the presence is where we actually start to like find the treasure of it, right? And we're so taught to focus on the thing and on the presence. And I keep, you know, I got me wondering whether is this part of the reason we keep continually seeking these peak experiences, you know, go to a plant medicine ceremony or a retreat or some sort of meditation or yoga class or whatever it is, right? And you have this peak experience and you like have this space where if it's facilitated well, you actually are really in that bridging that world between the absence and the presence between the soul and the human. Right. And that leads to this beautifully like heart opening, expansive, like sense of homecoming for both aspects of yourself. Right. And then we're like, okay, when's the next one? When's the next one? When's the next one? Right. And again, how much of that is because then we're focused on the presence, the experience, right? And we fear the absence. But if the absence from the thing, though, may actually be, it could either be then the creativity, that the longing, the creative impulse that sort of sparks the movement or the action, or it can be also the space of self-reflection, right? when we're kind of constantly doing, we can't actually reflect that deeply. So there's, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like maybe actually starting to question <laughs> what I said earlier a little bit, but that, I mean, well, or maybe not. So belonging, whether we feel it in the human realm or in the spirit realm is like, is that relaxation energy, the introspection energy, the expansion and softening energy, right? And then the longing is still the instigator. But again, our human and our spirit selves might find those in different places.
places is like what I'm sort of exploring right now. Um, and so there's this beautiful story that I think is often attributed to Russia, although I think Vasilisa um, is often, stories with Vasilisa are also often told in many Slavic and Baltic countries. Um, but one of the images as I was sitting with this like absence and presence and integration and kind of like the needing to actually be in the absence to kind of pick through the stuff. It was like, I had this image. There's this moment in the story of Vasilisa and so I'll quickly give a synopsis. So Vasilisa, um, her mother, when she's, you know, a youngish girl, her mother passes away. And right before her mother passes away, her beloved mother right before she gives Vasilisa this doll and says, keep this doll with you. And then I'll always be able to be with you. Right. So right there, there's something about presence and absence. Right. And so, and sort of this connection between the human 3d world and then kind of this absent spirit world and the doll kind of becoming this bridge. Right. And then waits a little while father remarries a stepmother. It's kind of a Cinderella story. So there's sort of that like evil stepmother, stepsisters kind of thing happening. And then of course the father becomes pretty much absent. <laughs> He's always off working. So there's again, sort of absence presence kind of thing. Right. And, you know, in the story, it's often, I think, sort of interpreted as a female initiation story. And I would agree with that, but I, I was kind of starting to explore it. Yeah. From this presence absence space. So at one point, you know, the step, the father's away, the stepmother and stepsisters decide we want to get rid of Vasilisa forever. The, they let the fire go out in the kitchen. There's no fire to, there's no way to start it. There's no embers. There's no, you know, so they send Vasilisa out into the dark, dark woods to find Baba Yaga to get, um, to ask Baba Yaga for fire. And they do this expecting Vasilisa to fail. Right. And so Vasilisa goes out into the woods. She manages to make her way to Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga, of course, being this presence of this sort of like am ambiguous, ambivalent presence of sort of the larger karmic cycles, right? Of like not wholly benevolent, but not wholly evil. Like it depends on kind of what what you're what you bring to the, the interaction, you know, how she responds. Um, so she sets Vasilisa these different tasks um, to prove her worth to get the fire. And some of the tasks are things like sorting mildewed corn from regular corn or sorting tiny, tiny poppy seeds from a giant pile of dirt, right? And so each time Vasilisa feels overwhelmed by the task and, you know, when Baba Yaga goes away and leaves Vasilisa to it and she talks to her doll and her doll always says something along the lines of go to sleep. It will all be better in the morning. And then the doll actually does the work while Vasilisa is sleeping. And so here too, there's this sense of like, where's the presence and where's the absence, right? And, and, and at night while the doll is doing this work, the spirit doll is kind of doing this work. There's sort of a sense of that dream space where what would seem impossible in the 3d realm kind of becomes possible but it also you know that that image of the picking through the things right like the finding the introspection time the quiet time being in the darkness being in the absence and that that's where a lot of this really important sorting starts to happen this sort of almost subconscious um or supra conscious um sorting starts to happen. And how like that can't actually happen entirely in the 3D realm, right? And so here's, yeah, where that absence, you know, becomes really important. Yeah. But then there's like, also then, you know, there's the, how do we then take what's been sorted while we're unconscious or in that more of that absence space and actually like live that in our day-to-day, -day, right? So then there's also the interactions in the story. If we're going back to the story, there's also then some interactions that Vasilisa has with Baba Yaga, like during daylight hours, 
you know, and at one point she asks Baba Yaga a question and Baba Yaga answers her. And then Baba Yaga says something like, do you have any other questions? And Vasilisa can sort of sense like, no, like don't ask more questions. Like this is a test too, right? And she says something along the lines of no, because I've learned like asking, there are some questions that, that, you know, I'm not meant to know yet, or that will age me too quickly or something like that. Right. And so she shows some wisdom in that sense. And that's also sort of part of the test. And so there is, there's this, like, we have to take what we learn in that absence, in that field of possibility and potentiality and whatever all else. And then we have to actually be able to bring it down into our human form, into our 3d form. And we have to figure out how to like live, um, live those things and steward those things. You know, every time I got a yoga pose that was like a quote unquote fancier yoga pose that I'd been struggling with or been challenged by, or hadn't come easily or naturally to me, right. The first time it happened, I would always be surprised <laughs> like, Whoa, it would kind of happen sort of in spite of me, you know? And then I wouldn't be able to do it again for like a long time, you know, because then it was like, it, it's almost like we have to sort of trip and fall into what's possible to then be like, okay, it is actually possible for me. And then we have to figure out, we have to put in the work to actually build the skills to actually, um, yeah, to inhabit what it is we then are trying to inhabit. And so then the next time we find ourselves in that place, it's because we've gone there intentionally. It's because we've actually mapped how to get there for ourselves. It's because we've built up the strength or the endurance or the um, mindset or the, you know, the habits or whatever, right? So let's see, just feeling into like where this conversation is going next. <laughs> Um, yeah. And so that's sort of where, yeah. So imagination and creativity seem to happen in that longing space. Innovation happens in that longing space, right? And then there's wisdom to sort through in the belonging space, or there's like a sense of assessment in the belonging space in the presence space whether that's spirit presence or human presence um yeah and so then it's like i've been sort of noticing too one of the things on the trip that i think felt so potent powerful um surprisingly easy in a lot of ways actually was that i dropped into a different rhythm I dropped into a rhythm that was much more soul body life, right? So it was like, what was my soul needing in that moment? What was my body needing in that moment? What was life bringing to me in that moment? And, and me, that meeting point between me and what was happening around me, right? Within me on the different levels and around me, right? And I somehow stumbled into just kind of living more in that rhythm. And I think that was part of what um, really at the heart of so many of the things that felt so good about that trip and who I was on that trip and how I was showing up on that trip and, and what the universe was then mirroring back to me on that trip, you know, in the experiences and the people and the, you know, whatever. And so I noticed too, when I got back, like, I was like, okay, back to life, back to work, back to this, back to that. You know, not that I wasn't working while I was over there, but I was, I'd taken a lot of the pressure off. I was not focused as much on it. And I came back and I was like, okay, got to focus in and like, kind of like bear down on all of that, you know? And I like immediately lost that rhythm. And I think that that's like part of what's been actually at the heart of a lot of the pain and the struggle that I've been experiencing in the last couple of weeks is, is like that I was off that rhythm. And, you know, and I think that that, so I'm starting to realize too, how key that rhythm is, you know, I think that rhythm is part of why we can be doing everything, like all the quote unquote, right things. And even like all the loving things for, you know, for the people we care about and still somehow seem absent from the connection or, um, you know, 
and so I think that's like, then I was like, oh, I think this is a lot of what my work is too, right? With people is actually helping them come back into that rhythm. And so, yeah, so it's just been sitting with this question of absence and presence or longing and belonging or sort of soul human and and really being in that and space has just got me sort of tuning into that rhythm again in a little bit of a different way um, and noticing kind of, okay, like that's a curiosity. I feel like I'm still really sitting with right now and living in right now is like, what, how is that rhythm, that sort of gentle push, pull, hug, rest, um, which is really at its heart about that absence, presence, longing, belonging, human spirit. Like, how is that actually setting my rhythm and how can I show up with, again, that sort of, that, um, that, that phrase that I'm working with right now, just with more kindness to myself within that rhythm. So yeah, I don't know, just kind of a sneak peek into my brain right now. So Oh, and if you want to know how the Vasilisa story ends, if you're unfamiliar with that story, she does end up getting the fire from Baba Yaga. And uh, she, yeah, takes it home. And the stepmothers and stepsisters are surprised to see her. And the, she's carrying the fire and ember in a skull, because Baba Yaga has lots of skulls. And the skull, like, shoots fire from its eyes and burns the evil stepmothers and stepsisters. And that's how the story ends. And there's lots of different sort of versions of that story with different nuances and things like that, but that's sort of the overview of it. So, um, yeah, so don't mess with fire <laughs> or Baba Yaga <laughs> or an initiated woman, uh, a woman who's mastered the art of presence and absence and rhythm. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think I'll leave it there for today. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear what, you know, what you think about this. Um, did this spark anything for you? Did this, any aha moments, um, anything you're like, oh, that sounds right to me, but not quite. What about this? Right. Like love to hear. So yeah. So you can always find me at www.wildsacredjourney.com or you can email me kate at wildsacredjourney.com. Um, and so, yeah. So thank you for, for joining me today, exploring absence and presence. So we'll just take a couple of deep breaths in and out to kind of start to close out our time around the fire for today. Noticing even here, right? Here's a moment on that precipice. Here we are listening, being in this conversation together. And then it's like, we're starting to turn away towards the absence of this conversation. But right now we're still with it, but we're right at that edge. You know? And that's beautiful. <laughs> hmm. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll see you next time around the fire. Hi, Kate here again. Thank you for gathering with us. Whether you've been here a while or found your way here thanks to today's guest, it means so much to me and the world I dream of to have you here. I hope you'll tune in for more of our conversations. We humans seem to be at a profound threshold and facing questions of deep impact for the future and the world. We need our full hearts and humanity as we sow seeds of change in these times of joy and heartbreak. I count myself lucky to be here now, around this virtual village fire, weaving our stories into a medicine with humans like you. As a community medicine space, this podcast is relational. It weaves webs of connection and mutual respect and care across time and space. If you appreciate and support the future we're seeding here, you can support the weaving of this web in a few ways. One, share episodes with friends and family or online with your community. It also helps the podcast immensely if you like, rate, subscribe to, or follow the podcast where you watch or listen, so you get notified when new episodes drop and new listeners find us as they search. Two, join us on Patreon. Doing so supports conversations like the one you just heard and allows you access to live community gatherings and medicine circles and more as we continue to grow. It also helps me keep this space advertisement free so the conversations stay intact as they are. 
If you have questions, suggestions, connections, or would like to find out more about working with me, you can find me online at www.wildsacredjourney.com, on Instagram at wildsacredjourney underscore KP, or email me, kate at wildsacredjourney.com. Until next time, from my heart to yours, I release today's fire with a prayer for our individual and collective wholeness, connection, and joy. May it be so.